what if one day our brothers and sisters and our neighbors and friends and our spouses and our parents and our children and our bosses and our colleagues all conspired together to pay us back for every wrong thing that we had done in each of those relationships. How would that day be for you? Would it be a good day? How about this? Would it be fair? What if, in some future moment, either in this realm or the next, God decides to pay us back for all of the ill will that we've ever cast from cradle to grave in a single big day of reckoning? How will that day be for you? Would it be good? Would it be fair? Today's scripture explores these questions. What if there was a giant day of reckoning for all of the things that we'd ever done? A lifetime of offenses, what if there was a giant day of reckoning ahead? But it explores these questions with all of the intrigue of a really brilliantly told story. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 50. This is a story of dreams and dungeons and deception and deliverance and reunions and reckoning. It's the story of a boy named Joseph. Now, Joseph is a, um, it takes about 14 chapters in the book of Genesis. It is, it is the biggest section of Genesis. It is a really beautiful novella, if you will, all its own. And so I'm going to try to recap this novella, 14 chapters, in just about as many sentences. So I thought I would sit in this terrific Joseph-like chair to see if I can tell this story. Once upon a time, there lived a boy named Joseph. Joseph was the most beloved of his father's 12 sons, and he wore an extraordinary coat of many colors as evidence of his father's favor. Among Joseph's compelling personal qualities, he was a dreamer. Joseph had big dreams from a young age about all his older siblings and even his own parents bowing down to him in honorific humility. One day, Joseph's brothers had had enough. They devised a plan to dispatch with Joseph by selling him into slavery. They then deceived their dad by presenting a color, the colorful coat stained with blood, insinuating that Joseph was dead. Grief ensued for everyone thereafter. Joseph was sold to a powerful man named Potiphar. That's right. Joseph climbed the ladder of Potiphar's favor, but then found himself imprisoned under false allegations of Potiphar's wife. In prison, Joseph employed his dream craft to interpret the dreams of the rich and powerful, including Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh's troubling dreams predicted global famine ahead. So Pharaoh enlisted Joseph as kind of a hybridized secretary of agriculture and treasury, storing up food reserves in advance. Joseph managed this role Effectively, and many people survived because of him. Now, with time 
And with a brilliant twist of fate, Joseph's brothers were forced to visit Egypt from afar in order to secure sustenance. The family back home was starving. Whether from fatigue or hunger or distraction or delirium, the brothers didn't recognize Joseph, who was recognizing them. Joseph, now effectively the prime minister of Egypt, he demands the brothers return home, bring back the whole family, including Joseph's elderly father, if they want to survive. And as they do, the tensions of power plays and gaslighting fuel the intrigue of this story as it leads to the final chapter, which is today's text. Open to Genesis chapter 50. We're going to read together verses 15 through 21. Let's go back a slide, if you would. Let's go back one now. So if you would, we're going to read this together. Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. And let's see how this story ends. I'd like to hear your voices this morning as we read together. If it's helpful for you, that's on page 42 in the Bible near your seat. This is the next to final scene in this brilliant story of a guy named Joseph. Verse 15, let's read. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Hmm. Mm. Every week I start looking at a text by asking it 20 questions. Before I open a commentary or look at a dictionary or anything, I just sit with the text and I ask 20 questions. And this week, this text raised a lot of really interesting questions for me. Like, question number one, um, next slide. How does the death or the departure of a father, a patriarch especially, how does it affect the surviving family members, the children and those who are left behind? How does, it, how does it alter the way that the relationships work when a significant person departs the system? That is, it, it changes things. The first question of today's text is like, how are things different now that Jacob is gone? That's a family systems question. What happens when one person changes their place in a system? How does it change everything about the relationships that follow? Or another question. How about this question, number two? Have people always enlisted other people are saying whenever they're trying to make their case, especially perhaps from a perspective of weakness? Have you ever had anybody come to you and say, hey, everybody's saying, bloop, 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 bloop in order to try to tell you you need to do something different. Have people always done that? <laughs> Maybe not. Seems that Joseph's brothers employ that strategy. And some commentators suggest that based on how flawed their character is from the very beginning of the story, that this is, and, and the fact that there's no evidence of Jacob ever saying anything like this in the book of Genesis, that this is just a concoction that the brothers use in order to save their own skin. And it's interesting to think about that, at least for me. Have people always 
employed what other people are saying in order to try to make their case? I don't know. Third question I found was interesting is, why is everybody weeping in this story? Joseph's weeping. (laughs) The brothers are weeping. And I wonder how many of us are really sappy suckers for a happily ever ending, happily ever after kind of story. Truth is, I can hardly handle some commercials that come on television, especially if there's a reconciliation between an adult child and a parent, or if there's two siblings who find a special kind of love. There's a, well, I won't go into those commercials, but all kinds of questions raised. But the biggest and the most interesting question for me this week is this question. How do our human inclinations and intentions and actions, how do those intersect with God's, particularly as each involve reckoning a lifetime of accumulated wrong? How do we go about reckoning a lifetime of accumulated wrongs? What if one day your brothers and sisters and your neighbors and friends and your spouses and your parents and your children and your bosses and your colleagues all conspired together to pay you back tit for tat for all of the ill will, all of the slights that you've made, all of the cheap shots you've taken, all of the insensitivities or insults that you've cast. What if on a single day of reckoning, a lifetime of accumulated offense had to come to a day of reckoning? How do we tend to approach that compared to how is God inclined in that scenario? I'm curious about the way those two things seem to dance in this story, culmination of book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. In this text today, we have on Joseph's own lips what is often called the theological interpretation of the story. Where it says in verse 20, even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good. Even though You may have intended it to harm me. God had different intentions or different inclinations. God is disposed differently, perhaps, than we are. That God's whole approach, God's whole perspective, God's whole looking at a situation seems to depart from the way that we might call natural or normal. I think it's a really interesting thing to notice and to think about together. How how do God's inclinations or dispositions differ from what yours and I, you and I may, may hold on to? I like what the Geneva Bible did here. This is a 16th century translation. When ye thought evil against me, God disposed it to good. God disposed it to good. It's interesting, this is a 3,000-year-old story of God disposing evil toward good. 3,000 years ago, the author to Genesis had this insight about God. Hmm. Now, is this a surprise to anybody that God would be differently disposed than you and I? Probably not a huge shock. Anybody memorize verses like this in Isaiah, maybe verse 55? Anybody remember that, memorize this? Let's read this together. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now that little text is only 2,600 years old. <laughs> it's kind of new by comparison to the Joseph story. Only 2,600 years old. In the book of Genesis, we come to this final chapter, and what's interesting to me is that there seems to be two models of justice on display. I'd like to just unpack those for the next couple of minutes. Two different models of justice. The first one I'm going to call um, maybe just like your brother's version of justice. It's like the common, like if your brother had the opportunity to come and have a day of reckoning with you, what might your brothers be thinking when that comes to pass. 
Genesis chapter 50, verse 15, is um, what we might call payback as justice. Now, how many of you are familiar with eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? You know that, right? That's first introduced inscription in the book of Exodus. It's a new principle. It's the principle of reciprocal justice or retributive justice. It's measure for measure, right? Now, um, the norm, I understand, before there was such a thing as eye for an eye or tooth for tooth, was just basic barbarism. And that is like this. Um, you kick me in the shins, I burn down your house. You know, or um, you insult my wife, I kill your family. And the effect of that model in the world was just a continual escalation of the vengeance, right? Like, you do this, I'm going to take it up a notch. You do this, I'm going to take it up a notch. So before, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, apparently that was kind of the law of the land. But there's a different law when God speaks into that world. A different rule gets introduced. And even though we first see it in the book of Exodus, it seems to me that even all the way before that in Genesis 50, that's kind of the norm that the brothers are longing for. That if there's to be a day of reckoning, I'm going to pray that maybe we'll just do eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth with this brotherly notion of justice. In fact, the brothers ask, uh, what if he pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did? Eye for an eye. What if he does the same? Now, just a quick question based on the story I told. What would that look like if Joseph, in fact, paid them back for what Joseph had done? I mean, what had been done to Joseph. What would that look like? A lot of what? Holes? Oh, a lot of holes being dug, yeah? All those brothers being tossed into holes. Yeah. Yeah, they've been slave. They've been sold into slavery, right? Well, in fact, that's exactly what the brothers are kind of hoping for. Next slide. Is that there would be this law of retaliation in place. Now, lex talionis is the Latin term for this principle, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Any lawyers or legal people among us who are kind of familiar with that? Lex talionis. And it means the law of exact retribution or precise payback or something like that. What's that? Measure for measure. Now, um, this was intended to limit the barbarism or the barbaric tendency towards vengeance. It was a new measure, a much more humane one. And it said basically, if a person, is, um, if a person commits a crime or insults or injures somebody, what is appropriate is that it's a comparable penalty or punishment put on that person. Or if you have been the victim of an injury or an insult, that what you then deserve is a, a comparable compensation. So if somebody accidentally kicks you in the shins, you can't sue them for a million dollars because that wouldn't be comparable. Lex talionis is the law. Now, interestingly, Lex talionis appears, actually, it predates showing up in Exodus. This idea of a fair principle is actually, it appears in the Babylonian uh, law of Hammurabi, which is a 18th century BC law code. We even have the archaeological evidence of this, this principle being introduced into humanity that, hey, we shouldn't just keep escalating the vengeance over and over. There has to be some sort of measure that we keep things fair. So justice is like, if I hurt you medium, I get punished medium. And if you get injured only a little, then you only do a, a little bit of compensation, not just an unlimited amount. Lex talionis. It became the law, not just in Exodus, but this became kind of the anchor of the whole Western idea of justice, law of exact retribution or reciprocation. This seems to be the model, I think, that's on display here in Genesis 50. What if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full? And again, next slide. They appeal this way. Please forgive us this crime. And the brothers fell down before him and said, we are now here as your slaves. Is this a fair outcome of the story? I mean, wouldn't it be fair that Joseph would in turn, just eye for an eye, tit for tat, tooth for tooth, 
You did this to me. I spent the last 30 years in slavery, in dungeons, in prisons. I happened to make it out, and now I'm doing okay. But now you come to me, and it's interesting to me that this model of fairness, they're actually hoping for slavery. They, if, they appeal to this principle of fairness as if that's the best possible outcome. What if he does worse? <laughs> what if he beheads us all? Maybe we should just appeal to be slaves. Well, so my question for us to think about for a minute together is, do you and I still today appeal to fairness as the best possible outcome? As a highly desirable outcome, do you and I tend to long for that in our own ways of being? When I think about the popularity of countless cop shows and TV dramas around law firms and courtrooms, or even the recent rise of like forensic crime podcasts. Anybody listen to those recently? A crime is done and we just can't wait for the next episode where they peel back the next layer of evidence of what happens. It seems that there's a kind of appetite in our culture that we just can't get enough. We have a deep fascination around this notion of making sure that the bad guy gets what's due. The law of lex talionis. Principle of reciprocation. The principle of fairness. The brotherly notion that, hey, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Except maybe when it comes to you and me, right? What if one day our brothers and sisters our neighbors and friends, our spouses and children, our employees and bosses all conspired together to simply return to us any kind of insult or injury we had done upon them in any of those realms of our life. Would that be fair? Yeah, it would be fair. But how many of us are satisfied that that should be the law of the land? That when someone offends, really, the thing we should shoot for is making sure they get their due. Law and order. It's in its 26th season this year. Did you know that? We just can't get enough of making sure that the bad guy gets his due. But I wonder if there's another model that we might look into. I wonder if there's a better way of thinking about what we should do when there's an insult or an injury or a crime or something that's unfair. Is there a different way we could go about conceiving of it? I don't know, just put yourself in the shoes of the guilty for a moment. Is there another way that you think it might be dealt with other than just being cast into some sort of reciprocal or retributive justice? Well, friends, I have good news for you. God is differently disposed. God is differently inclined. God is seemingly not interested in something like retribution as the primary way. God seems to be interested in something that's actually beyond fair. In fact, you could leave here today and you could say, you know, God is not fair. Because God seems to be, according to this story, interested in something beyond lex talionis as the law of the land. And I think we see that in this second model of justice, and it appears in the person of Joseph in this great story. This alternative model in Genesis is beyond fairness. Now listen to this, Joseph. Joseph suffered indisputably, right, at the hands of his brothers. Is that true? He suffered indisputably. And now he has a flawless case, including a full confession. True? His brothers are right there in front. Like, we did all this. Joseph has all of the power and all of the right and, and, and all of the mechanisms in order to execute the law of reciprocation or retribution with no problem, right? I mean, he can do this. He's in charge. And yet, Joseph takes a different kind of approach. Joseph seems to employ a different model for what is just. Joseph employs the model of maybe restoration rather than 
retribution. Even though the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth hadn't formally been introduced into the narrative at this time, it seems that this ancient, ancient, ancient story reveals that there are some inclinations inside this man named Joseph towards a model of justice that is beyond fairness. There's something maybe better than fairness. There's something superior to retribution, no matter how precise the retribution may be. And Joseph seems to employ that. Joseph, who has all the ability to make this final sentence really terrible for those brothers, he instead, in, after the brothers make all of their final appeal, Joseph hands down this sentence to his brothers, who are fully guilty. He says this. Let's read it together. Do not be afraid. Though you intended to do harm, God disposed it for good. Have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. And in this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to him. Now, I'd like us to just take two minutes real quick. Um, let's go back a slide, please, Sarah. Hey, would you, Laura, would you play for us just about two minutes? Here's what I'd like us to think about together. Let's go back a slide, Sarah. Go ahead. Just to talk with each other for just a second about um, I don't know, maybe the the nature or let's about the, let's compare those two models retribution and restoration. Now let's just talk about how those would play out in our actual world in the twenty first century if you and I had a choice of how we were going to go about thinking about the ills and injuries and insults in this world. Let's. Let's talk about this for just a minute together, shall we? Laura's going to play for two minutes. So we'll call it a two-minute drill. And let's just talk about the difference between retribution versus restoration. Let's just talk about that together, shall we? Let's stand up. We'll find somebody to talk to you for just two minutes. I can't wait to hear what you have uh, come up with in your thinking about these two models. <laughs> I was thinking about the way we prayed together a couple minutes ago, and I heard almost all of us say something like this, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive As we forgive those who trespass against us. Is that ever hard for you to pray? Yeah. Did it get easier for you with time? Yeah. Some days it's easier for me than other days. Forgive us our trespass. As we forgive. So what do you think um, about reciprocal justice? Retributive justice versus restorative justice. Any interesting thoughts emerge in your in your conversations? I just think how easy it is to establish one thing and get our behavior to the other. Okay. You know, I can be grounded in the Sunday school saying, all of the good things, and God forgives, and he's got to do it. We should forgive. And then what do I do when I go home to my spouse? <laughs> Ah, does anybody else resonate with what Ashley's saying? See the only one who butts heads with her husband after proclaiming the grace and me. Yeah, what's that? There's a marriage Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it doesn't, it doesn't apply in marriage. No, no, apparently you're off the hook. Stay as mad and as <laughs> seething as you wish. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that, Ashley. Yeah. Two different, two different applications, maybe. Uh, or I wonder if Joseph would have the same response when he was a young man. Mm. Versus later, when it really seems to be a, an awkward issue of maturity. Yeah. 
That's great. If you couldn't hear what Zach just said, uh, he wonders if Joseph would have had that same response or that same inclination as a younger person, or if this is maybe in part a product of maturity, of his own, his own journey. Or to build on that, what if, yeah, because he had already been raised up, like he'd already seen the redemption, so it's easy for him to be magnanimous, but what if he were still in prison at that point, and none of the good things were done? Excellent. He could still fulfill yeah. He's, he's a product of a real life story, right? And those, we're all products and participating in real life stories, and it maybe depends on from whence you come, and determines how you respond. That's helpful, and I, when I think about the whole world and how different people are inclined differently, and um, depending on what your, what your journey has been, shapes how, you, how much access you may have to the notion of restoration versus retribution. You may not even be able to see that quite yet. Interesting. Not have been there, but it seems as though there was still a small part of him that was holding that grudge, but he makes a choice. Right? Mm. I love this. If you didn't hear Alan, he says, it seems that there may be a part of Joseph that's still holding on to some of this, um, and yet he makes a choice. Some commentators say that Joseph did not forgive his brothers here. Um, that In fact, Joseph isn't even interested in forgiveness as we might define it, but he makes a decision toward mercy or grace or something, whether or not he actually feels all the way free that it's over. He makes a decision, a cognitive choice to pass along something other than what he received. That's interesting, isn't it? Not all the commentators say that, some, but some say, no, he didn't forget. Even though, even though the editors put in bold print at the top, Joseph forgives his brothers, some commentators say he didn't forgive them but he passed along something superior to what he had received by choice. Love is not a feeling. Maybe mercy is not a feeling. It's a choice we make. John and I were talking about two separate situations where with neighbors, if you don't, if you just do the minimum, then it can devolve into something like in the town of, I, I know of in Greece, Mm, I love this. If you didn't hear, various towns and different countries have um, maybe mm, kind of nursed their grudges against each other and fortified themselves. What was that? They cultivated their grudges against you. Yeah. Cultivated their grudges such that they are now they are now entirely predisposed with animosity toward each other, such that their whole posture if, is one of defensiveness. If those people come up my driveway, I've got all my guns. I'm going to take care of them. That kind of thing that's a, maybe a bit of a cliche, but also seems to be employed by people in ways that aren't. It's, in our country. it's, not, it's not just a caricature. Yeah. 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 It, it, when we appeal only to the fairness principle, it seems like that could be a very natural result. Was that the Romeo and Juliet, Monty Hughes, and uh, what the other? Is that how they got there? Hatfields and McCoys, some small offense that gets nursed or cultivated into some massive kind of thing. Does anybody get a lump in your throat at that moment in a movie or a TV show where you know grace is about to be or is being given and the music goes just right and suddenly you can't hold back, you're just about to, you know, you get a lump. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
The weeping happens. And that's why I think everybody might be weeping in this story. Is there something beyond fairness that's happening? There's something beyond tit for tat. There's something beyond, you kick me in the shins, I burn down your house. There's something beyond that. There's something better that's at play here. And I ask you this question finally, which model actually leads to freedom? Retributive justice or restorative justice? If his brothers had just been given what's fair, they would have been stuck in a lifetime of servant living, slavery. What would the relationships have been like between the brothers? They would have been permanently soured and stuck in a land of retribution because it's fair. But the book of Genesis, this ancient book, shows us something different. It's an old, old story. And I contend to you that if you watch the storyline of these brothers, they enter this story as deeply flawed characters, just as envious and murderous as Cain is towards Abel. But these 12 brothers, they exit this story and they are free. <laughs> they are liberated to live a new day. And I find it so fascinating that this 3,000-year-old story has the wisdom woven into it to give us a picture that's bigger than fairness as the norm. In fact, if I just zoom out a little bit and I look at the whole book of Genesis, the book of Genesis, the opening act is humanity breaking the one law, right? But the closing scene of Genesis is not a fair trial. It's something better. It's not a fair, it's not retributive justice. It's not, it's not just reciprocity. Genesis closes with a model called mercy or forgiveness. This ancient story gives us this alternative possibility as a way that life can be more than enslavement to past sins. And if you read what happens just in those last few verses of the book of Genesis, you can see what happens with their relationships, how the next generation is not stuck in the uh, defending ourselves in fortress against the other person, how babies are born to, on each other's laps, how they encourage the next generation with a kind of freedom and grace and mutuality. It's just this beautiful story. It would lead to weeping if I weren't just talking about it, but if we had it maybe music with it or something. And so, friends, I'd like us to think for ourselves about which model we really do ascribe to in this world. What if one day your brothers and sisters and neighbors and friends and spouses and children and parents, your bosses and colleagues all had the chance to conspire together to pay you back tit for tat? I wonder if that's really, though fair it may be, if that's the model for justice that we want in this world, or if maybe there's something better. I can think of 10 things Jesus said. I can think of the teachings of Paul, but I'd like to close. At the risk of being preacherly today, stereotypically preacherly, I'd like to close with this poem. This poem is about the God that Genesis talks about. It's a God who seems never to want to conspire to repay us, but a God instead who's not even inclined that way. The poem reads like this. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful that you are not fair. The 
but you're beyond what we think of as fairness. I thank you that your ways are not our ways and that we don't just have what's coming to us. I thank you for that the scripture from cover to cover reveals you as a God of grace and that even when we alienate ourselves from you, you choose to love us more by being more involved with us. And may, it may be uncomfortable at times, but that your goal is always unfettered union between humanity and divinity. And I pray today that you might help us release the obstacles to which we cling so that we may join you in something beyond Lex Talionis. I thank you that you love us endlessly and stubbornly. Help us to receive that love anew today. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.